how much of ourselves are we willing to give away to artificial intelligence, to Alexa running all of the machines in our house, turning on the lights, turning on the heat, turning on the stereo, to Siri answering all of our questions. I mean, these are just examples we're seeing play out in everyday lives. We find ourselves subtly giving away more and more of ourselves to the machines, to the technology. Now, I'm really clear about what I'm saying. I'm a scientist, I'm a degree geologist. I've worked in the world of, of high tech uh, during the, the Cold War years. I worked on the, the SDI, Star Wars Defense Initiative. And the only reason I say that is because in the process of that work, I witnessed a technology that was so advanced. I mean, lasers that are able to, to access uh, deep into space and return uh, with information and radar systems. And, and I, I've had the opportunity to see this technology. And I'm also a scientist, and I have been with scientists who have an ongoing conversation about how, techno how technology should, should be used. Is it right, wrong, is it good, or is it bad? Uh, and there are two schools of thought when it comes to this. There's one school of thought that I often hear that says, if we were never meant to use the things that we create, we never would have been given the intuition and the insight and the technology to build them. In other words, because we have the, the technology, it's meant to be used. There's another school of thought that says, well, not so fast. Just because we have that technology, does it really mean that we should use it in our lives? It's kind of like having a Maserati that goes way past the speed limit on the local freeway just because we can bury that stomp speedometer <laughs> on, on the other side of the dial, does that mean that we should? So the, the answer is, uh, it's up to us. The technology itself isn't good, bad, or right, or wrong. It's how we apply that technology in our lives. Let me give you a perfect example, and it's one I'm sure that you've seen before. You know, a lot of times, we make great advances in technology during wartime. Uh, the war effort uh, generally is given a lot of attention, a lot of money, uh, a lot of human capital, great minds come together to solve problems and forge ahead in technology, and the result is applied to war. Splitting the atom is a perfect example. Uh, the Manhattan Project. When the, the scientists at the Manhattan Project learned to accomplish what they had accomplished, to release the power of the atom, there are so many ways it could have been applied for human good, for peacetime endeavors. And because it was wartime, uh, it was applied to a weapon, to the first nuclear weapons. So we have now nuclear medicine because we learned to release that energy, nuclear agriculture because we learned to release that energy, and nuclear weapons still exist in the world today. Perfect example. The technology is not right, wrong, good, or bad. It's up to us in terms of how we apply it. Well, the same applies to the new high-tech uh, technology that we see in our lives today. We are the first digital generation. Uh, and I think you'll probably agree with me that we are more connected than we've ever been. You know, I had the opportunity in the, uh, the mid-90s all the way up through the early 2000s uh, to lead groups into the highlands of central China and Tibet, in the monasteries of Tibet. And in those monasteries, many of them, they don't have electricity. They still use oil burning lamps. And the, the corridors are typically darkened even in the middle of the day. And I remember the first time that I saw the monks walking down those darkened corridors in their traditional maroon robes with a glow under the robes. And at first I thought, what, you know, are they hiding a flashlight in their robes or you know, what's going on? And then I realized there were cell phones. These were mobile phones that these monks had that were connecting them in ways they had never been connected before, taking them out of the isolation of being in a monastery, connecting with other monks in their own monastery and, and monks in other monasteries. So in a very real sense, I'm just using that as, as an example, we are now more connected than we've ever been, but this is where it gets very, very interesting. Because what the studies are showing is that while we are more connected than we've ever been, we are more alone than ever before. We feel more alone. That the, the digital connections are replacing the contact, the emotional intimacy of human to human contact. So when we're on WhatsApp or when we're on FaceTime, 
uh, you know, we're connecting with someone else halfway around the world. It can be a good thing if it's temporary, you know, if we're separated because of military duty or business. But as a way of life, it is creating uh, a, a generation that is more lonely than ever before. The image you're seeing on your screen, it's a street and it doesn't make any difference what city that street is in. It could be any city of any major metropolitan uh, uh, metropolitan city uh, population in, in the world. And what you're seeing is all those people in focus, they're all walking the same direction, but they're all in their own digital bubble, their own digital world, deeply engrossed in whoever or whatever is on the other end of the device that they're connected with. Now, uh, not right, wrong, good or bad, but this kind of connection is replacing, again, the, the human intimacy. It's not uncommon for young couples today uh, to have professional lives where each of them have their own career. So they see one another early in the morning, first thing in the morning before they go to work, and they see one another at the end of the day when they come home from work, when they're absolutely toast, uh, because all of their energy, the best of them has been given to the day where they were not in the presence of one another. I think you, you know what I'm talking about here. Uh, so it's not uncommon to see couples create special time for themselves. Let's say, you know, hey, we've been working hard all week. Let's go out and have, let's go to a uh, hot springs or let's go to have a nice dinner together, which I think is a good thing to reconnect. But look at what is happening more and more. You see in the lower left-hand corner, there's a couple having a beautiful dinner together. And before they're even finished with their meal, they're both on their devices. They're both on their, on their cell phones. Now, if it's by agreement, maybe it's a good thing. Maybe they're checking work. Maybe they're checking the babysitter. I don't know what's happening there. But they're both doing it. Maybe not much of a problem. But look at the upper right-hand corner. And this is what I see more often than not. Uh, and maybe I'm projecting a little bit here, but it looks to me like the woman is not very happy about what the man is doing in that picture. They're having a beautiful meal together and he's checking his phone. She's not checking hers. Uh, it causes frustration. It causes uh, a sense uh, of less intimacy in that moment because his awareness, his attention is now focused on something else and not on her. Uh, and we're seeing this more and more in technological societies. Look at our young people. We have an entire generation of young people that only know a world with digital connectivity and cell phones. And I have seen young people when they have either lost their mobile phones or they've been in places where there was no access to the internet in remote places uh, uh, like the Andes Mountains of Peru, for example, where they could not access their friends. And there is a process. They actually go through a frustration uh, an emotional withdrawal, a psychological withdrawal, a physical withdrawal, a depression that comes from this um, because of the addiction, the chemicals that fire up in our bodies and our brains when we have access to this technology, the oxytocin, the dopamine, the adrenaline from having instant access to the information. And when we lose that access, all of, of those very addictive chemicals want more and more and more of something that's not available, that is a problem. But it's going even, even deeper than this. You know, there was a time in our lives where we had a very good idea of what a robot looks like. Uh, in science fiction, primarily, robots look like what you see on your screen right now. And robots, if they were made to have human attributes, they were typically used around the house, menial chores, repetitive tasks, and things like that. Guess what? Robots don't look like that anymore. On the right-hand side of your screen, these are robots. They are handsome. They are beautiful. Uh, they are human-like. And if they look that good, you know they're going to be used for more than housework and menial chores. Uh, and if that was your guess, you're right on. There's an entire industry now that is growing in some societies where the demand for these robots is so high uh, that they're having a hard time keeping the robots in stock. Here's the problem. The robots are more than just uh, an occasional pastime. They're being embraced as a way of life and they are replacing intimate human connection on a physical as well as an emotional level. And the reasons when people are asked, why would you prefer uh, a digital robot? The reasons are because they're easy, 
uh, clean relationships. You don't have arguments. You don't have differences of opinion. Uh, they're always ready for physical intimacy when, when a human wants that intimacy. Uh, and when they don't want that intimacy, then you just walk away. You don't have the messiness of human emotions, human frustration, human desires, human dreams. And what can happen when personalities clash? You don't have any of that when you're dealing with a robot. So if it were an occasional thing, uh, it might not have the significance that I'm giving it now. What's happening is that these robots are being embraced as a way of life and as a trend in some societies that is going beyond just the digital relationships. Actually, humans now legally can marry an artificially intelligent device, a robot, in some societies like the one you're seeing right now. Just a little quick test. One of, one of the beings that you see on your screen is a human, one's not. Guess which one is the human? And if you guess the man with the big smile on his face, you're right. That man has just married his female uh, dream girl, his robot, uh, and he looks very happy ab about that marriage. We're seeing more and more of these because it's becoming more and more legal, but it doesn't end with the marriage. Humans now are opting for digital robotic artificial babies for the same reasons. They're clean, they're easy. Uh, they are available when the humans are available with busy schedules, and when the humans aren't available, they just put these robots on the shelf. They get a good night's sleep, they don't have diapers to change, they don't have the terrible twos, they don't have the emotional uh, process that the young children will go through as they mature. Uh, and this now is becoming a trend in some societies. All of this is leading to uh, uh, what I feel is a very slippery slope. And I'm, I'm going to identify it now, and then I'm going to talk about it in a couple of different ways. I know that you have heard a phrase, use it or lose it. We hear this all the time. It's true in biology. We have capacities, we have abilities, we have cells, we have neurons. We have biology that is designed to, to function and be used on a constant basis. When those capabilities are replaced with chips, wires, machines, artificial intelligence, what the studies suggest is that those biological abilities begin to atrophy. We begin to lose them. Here's where this could be a problem. Uh, again, this is Elon Musk. Uh, and I'll be very, very clear. Clear communication is important to me. I have a lot of respect for Elon Musk. No animosity. He's a brilliant man. Brilliant. He's a visionary. He's young. He's wealthy. Um, he sees the sky is the limit, and he is pushing the boundaries in society and in technology, uh, in some ways, good ways. He developed PayPal for connectivity and, and ways of doing commerce, Tesla automobile, Tesla battery, SpaceX, civilian space uh, program, and uh, he has developed Neuralink, the first company developing the physical chip to be implanted into the human brain where neurons actually connect to the chip for the purpose of interfacing with a computer uh, through a Bluetooth-like technology. I'm not saying it's Bluetooth, but it's, it's a wireless technology. So no wires between us and the computer. So the chip is being implanted into the neocortex, which will be important in just a moment. And with that implant, we have direct access to the hard drive of another computer. So you say, what's the problem? What's wrong with that? I mention this in audiences with young people, with young gamers for example. And I have young people say to me, wow, you mean I could, I could game without ever touching my keyboard? I could game with no cables and no wires? And the answer is pretty much, yep, yeah, that's, that's what it is. And they see no problem with this whatsoever. The problem that I see is this, and I'm going to come back to this conversation of technology mimicking and replacing something that we already have. Maybe you saw the movie, The Matrix. Uh, Keanu Reeves did a beautiful job. And if you didn't, I don't want to spoil this. But there was a theme in the movie uh, where in the future, in uh, a realm that only some people are aware of in the future, uh, individuals would learn quickly by physically plugging a cable into a port at the base of their skull. And they would download the programs that would help them uh, to learn something very quickly. So uh, Keanu Reeves in the movie, his name is Neo, and Neo very famously downloads a martial arts program 
Uh, so as a martial artist myself, I was fascinated by this. Uh, it was a Kung Fu program because he needed to learn self-defense very quickly. And in a matter of seconds, this plug is, is implanted uh, or is plugged into his brain. The download begins and he rolls over and looks at the camera and very famously says, I know Kung Fu. It's a great movie. If you haven't seen it, I'm going to encourage you to see it. When we see something like that happening and we see it through the devices, there is a philosophy that says everything that we create outside of our bodies mirrors what we already have within our bodies. This is an emerging philosophy that says that consciousness is informing itself through its creations. So consciousness created the movie The Matrix. We'll talk about this a little bit more in, in this program. Where did that idea come from? The bottom line is that we are that technology. We have the ability to learn very quickly without a wire being plugged into our brain if we use specialized cells that were only discovered recently uh, that are in the neocortex precisely where the chips are being implanted. 